there are certain things you can do in a lab, and this is, again, something that Einstein didn't think about, that David Bohm did think about, and that Bell picked up from Bohm, so there's a whole story here. But it's something we call doing spin measurements. And you don't need to understand anything much about them except that when you do a spin measurement on a particle, um, in the standard way, you have, you have a magnet called a stern gerlach magnet. And the stern gerlach magnet, that's what these were for, has a funny geometry. So there's a north, like a north pole and a south pole to this magnet, but they're not geometrically the same. The north pole is kind of pointy and the south pole is flat. Mm -hmm. And the result of that just classically is that if you think of the magnetic field lines here, they're, um, they change from top to bottom, right? They're not uniform. And the effect of that is that when you send a particle that has a magnetic moment, so is itself like a little magnet, it'll be deflected by that field. If the field were uniform, it typically wouldn't be deflected, but because it's stronger in some places than others, it's deflected. And quantum mechanically, the prediction is, this is not a classical prediction, that for certain particles, so-called spin half particles, every particle will either be deflected up toward the pointy part or down away from the pointy part by the same amount. So this is where Whereas classically, there's a continuum, quantum mechanically, things are discretized, either it's deflected up or down. So to do one of these experiments, there are only two pieces of data that need to be recorded. What direction was the magnet pointed? Because you can rotate the magnet in space, you can point it any direction you want. And was the result up or down? Mm -hmm. Spin up or spin down? Now, the first thing that I, what, what Einstein noticed, if we go back, this is the Einstein Podolsky Rosen paper. He wasn't looking at spin, but he was looking at other cases. Is that for certain quantum states, you get this following just with two particles, you get this following funny thing that the quantum mechanical prediction, if you ask, will this particle, suppose I'm going to check them both in this direction, call it the z direction. If we check for spin in of both these particles, here's Alice and Bob is way over here. Um, it's 50-50 whether she'll see up or down. It's 50-50 whether he'll see up or down. If they just sit there in their labs and you, you're sending out these particles, they'll just see a random set of ups and downs. No pattern at all. Mm -hmm. But when they get back together and compare their results, they'll notice that there's a correlation. Whenever Alice got up, Bob got down. Whenever Alice got down, Bob got up. So each can predict, even though at the beginning of the experiment, neither can predict what they're going to see. When Alice gets her results, she not only gets her result, but she's now in a position to accurately predict what Bob saw. So those things are called EPR correlations, perfect correlations. They allow the results of one experiment over here to give you information about the results of another experiment over there. Now, Einstein didn't think there was anything particularly spooky about that, and there isn't anything particularly spooky about that. As people say, you take a dollar bill and rip it in half and put each half into an envelope and send one envelope to Alice and one to Bob. Um, and they know how you did that, but, but you kind of shuffle the envelopes. So they would say, well, 50-50, whether I get this half or that half. But once I open my envelope, I know what the other one gets. It, nothing spooky about that. That's yeah. just, that's what we call updating, right? That's this Bayesian updating. I get new information. That's information about what happened in my lab. And also because of how these things were set up, it's information about what's going to happen in Bob's lab, yeah. right? Nothing spooky at all. What would be spooky, EPR pointed out, is if you said, look, it wasn't determined what Alice was going to see until she opened her envelope. It's not that she didn't know, but it wasn't even determined that something fundamentally chancy happened, Yeah, right? That, that Alice and Bob were actually sent identical envelopes with identical contents, right? Not the left side to, to Alice and the right side to Bob, but neither left nor right to Alice and neither left nor right to Bob. Yeah. And furthermore, when Alice opened her envelope, magically her <laughs> opening the envelope forced it to become either right or left. And then even more magically, that also forced Bob's half way over there to be the opposite. Okay, that's spooky. That's really spooky. That's spooky action at a distance, right? So there's the God plays dice part when she opens her envelope, but there's the spooky action at a distance part by the fact that Bob always sees the opposite. 
Now, Einstein thought that was ridiculous, right? Why would you believe that? No reason to. What you should assume is that it's predetermined from the beginning when you put them in the envelopes, which was the right half and which was the left half, and all you did was send this thing out. So that would explain this phenomenon. If you shuffle them, it would explain why it's 50-50 on each side, and it's easy to explain these correlations. Nothing spooky at all. What Bohr is insisting, because he's insisting on the incompleteness of the quantum mechanical state, is that there must be spooking action at a distance in a situation where you don't need it. That's why he was so upset. That's what the EPR paper was about. Now, let's change the situation a little bit. Again, this is kind of jumping over what Bell looked at to GHC. So now we've got three labs. We've got Alice, we've got Bob, and we've got Charlie. And again, they're all separate, and we can separate them as far as we want. Here's Charlie. He's in white. Separate them 100 billion billion miles. Doesn't matter. The theory doesn't care how far apart they are. At the center, we have a device that creates triples of particles and sends one off to Alice, one off to Bob, one off to Charlie. Okay? And we're going to assume that Alice and Bob and Charlie could, in principle, set their little magnets in any direction they want, but we're going to restrict them. So either they only each has two choices, either set it in the Z direction, which will be this way, or in the X direction, which is at right angles. So either Z or X here, either Z or X here, either Z or X here. So, okay, three things, there are two choices. So there are eight possibilities globally. Maybe they're all Zs, maybe they're all Xs, maybe one is one and the other two. Okay, there are eight ways you can do that. Yep. Um, they are free to choose whichever direction they want in whatever way they want. They can use random number generators. They can go off the digits of pi. They can do it on the number of shares of stock sold on the <laughs> stock exchange. They can look at the light from distant distant quasars, which is, has been done for various reasons. Okay, but <laughs> anyway, so effectively, these are random selections. Now, what's the data? So here's the question is, could you prearrange the outcomes of these experiments to get the quantum mechanical prediction? So I hope everybody's with. So what are those predictions? Well, there are two of them. If they all choose X, well, I guess I usually do Z. I don't know. It doesn't matter. If they all choose Z, let's say, they all happen to, uh, let's let Z be up. So they all happen to pick that they're going to check for spin in that direction. Quantum mechanics predicts with certainty, with absolute 100% certainty, so this is going to be perfect correlations, there will be an odd number of up outcomes. Now, it could be one, it could be three. It doesn't tell you which of those it'll be, but it says it, you'll never get zero, you'll never get two, right? So just stop there and think, okay, wait. So if they all check X, there'll be an odd number of X outcomes. So that means if I know what Alice got and what Bob got, I can now predict with certainty what Charlie got, right? So these are these perfect EPR correlations. Is there anything spooky about that? Well, not if it's predetermined from the beginning. It's nothing spooky. Maybe it's predetermined from the beginning. They'll all get up if they check X, or, or, or that Alice will get up and they'll get down. The other two will get down. If you predetermine it, it's fine, but these are these perfect correlations. If you say something chancy happens to Alice, then the question is, but then how do, how do Bob and Charlie, how do their particles know what Alice's did? That's spooky action at a distance. Okay, so prediction. If they all check Z, there'll be an odd number. The other case we care about is what if one of them checks Z and the other two check X, right? Now, there are other cases in that, but we don't care about the other cases. So one Z, it's either all Zs or one Z and two Xs. The one Z and two Xs can happen in three different ways because it could be Alice who checks Z, it could be Charlie, it could be Bob. But here's the prediction of quantum mechanics. If it's one of those cases, for sure, 100%, there will be an even number of up outcomes. Could be zero, could be two, but an even number, always. And again, if I know two, I know what the last one did. That's all you have to remember. Now you say, I don't want spooky action at distance. That means I have to predetermine all of these outcomes. Can I predetermine them so that no matter what, this is like 
no matter which two you pick, I lift my hand and they're different colors, no matter which ones they pick, it'll work out okay, okay? And the answer is you can't. And this is mathematically, and it's kind of easy to see mathematically. Um, although, can I use your pen and paper and yep. just draw something that if there's a, yeah, good. So here's the diagram of the situation. This is, as far as I know, was invented by David Merman, this way of presenting it, and it's really lovely. So I'll just give you this diagram. And the reason why I want to do this is because I really do want people to understand this argument's not hard. It's not really obscure. Uh, Z A, Z B, Z C, D, D, X, A. So you can Let's show that. Yeah. see this. It's just this nice little kind of structure, truss structure. I've got... Z, A, Z, B, Z, Z, C, and this dotted line. So this represents Alice choosing to measure Z, Bob choosing to measure Z, Charlie choosing to measure Z. And then here's Charlie C, Bob, uh, ch sorry, uh, um, Charlie X, yeah. Bob X, Alice X. Mm -hmm. So the first prediction was if they all measure Z, there'll be an odd number of outcomes. So that if, if I imagine an outcome, I predetermine an outcome by writing U or D in each circle, I need an odd number of U's written in these three. But if they choose this or they choose this, the, the solid lines, which is two X's and one Z, there has to be an even number of U's, an even number of U's, an even number of U's. So now it's a very clear question. Can I write the letter U and the letter D in each of these circles in such a way that there are an odd number of views along here, even along here, even along here, even along here, right? That's a really clear question. Now, first, let me just try, right? I'll just give it a shot. We want, let's begin here. We want an odd number of views. It's got to be one or three. Let's, again, the easy thing, make it three, because then I don't have to make any further decisions. So yeah. I'll just write... <laughs> You, you, you. Okay, so at this point, if it happens that they all check Z, we're okay, they'll get an odd number. The central one, there's nothing really to force that. I'll just put a D in there. But now, my other constraints start to bite. So I need an even number of U's along this row. I've got one, that's a D. I'm forced to put a U here. So I've got five out of six. Only this last circle, but I'm screwed, right? Because to make it even along this row, I have to put a U, and to make it even along that row, I have to put a D. Can't, that doesn't work, right? It doesn't work. Now, you might say, well, do it some other way. Maybe there's some way to make it work. And then Merman, David Merman gave this lovely argument. He says, look, it can't be done. How can I show you it can't be done? It's an argument by reductio ad absurdum. Suppose for a minute there's some way to do it. So suppose there's some way to write U's and D's in those circles that satisfy all those constraints. Okay. Pick up the ones along the dotted row. That has to be an odd number of U's. Throw them into a hat. Then pick up along this row. That's an even number. Throw them in the hat. This row, even. Throw them in the hat. This row, even. Throw them in the hat. So what have I got in the hat? Odd, even, even, even. I have an odd number of U's. That's all the math involved here. That... An odd number plus an even number plus an even number plus an even number is an odd number. I have an odd number of views in the hat. But I picked up every disc twice because every single one of these circles is along, intersected by two of these lines. So no matter how I put U and D in these circles, I can't have an odd number of views in the hat, which means there is no possible way to predetermine these outcomes locally so that what Alice does doesn't affect Bob, what Bob does doesn't affect Alice and Charlie, right? You can't, no local theory in Bell's sense can make these predictions. Quantum mechanics makes these predictions. The world fulfills quantum mechanical predictions. So no Bell local theory can account for this. So the true physics, whatever it is, whatever it is, can't be Bell local. That's the argument. And 
there are not many moving pieces to this argument. It's not like, you know, having to check Andrew Weil's proof of Fermat's last theorem where it's <laughs> 400 pages long and nobody can, you know, you, you can, you know, you can do this at home, right? You can check out yourself at home. You can't do it. <laughs> so that's the kind of thing when you say Bell proved that certain phenomena cannot be predicted and explained by any relativistically local theory. This is an example. And so it tells you something goes faster than light. There's some causal connection, right? There is some way that what Alice does, her choice, or Bob or Charlie, has to have some influence on the outcomes of some of the other experiments. Now, if you add in this foliation that I talked about, and you say, well, how can I do this? How can I write down a theory that does this? Okay, add in this foliation. Then one of the three experimenters will be the first. And you can write down a theory in which the, the choice of the first experimenter has influence on the later ones. And you can work it, and you can write it down, clean mathematics, it all works out, but it's non-local. So that 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 that's the short story. It's not, you know, and it doesn't take that long to explain. That's why it's a shock. As I said, I gave this talk, I gave exactly this proof. And, you know, a guy trained in astrophysics said, we, we never went over any of this in our texts. How long does it take to do? Right? Why doesn't every physics student understand this? Because they don't want to talk about it. Because as soon as you talk about it, then there's some, some kid's going to put up their hand and say, but how do you explain this? Yeah. <laughs>